seven, yeah. Benny's been doing this for 14 weeks now, which seems crazy. I know. To think. Yeah. yeah, we were pretty early on on this. I've had conversations with many different, you know, segments in our industry, and um, the hotel industry is obviously one that's really rocked right now, and they're really trying to, you know, figure out. It's like they, they don't know. There's no way they know. Part owner of a restaurant here, one of the partners in a restaurant we know, um, he's in the financial side of the business that had to go to Vegas last week. He said it was the eeriest thing ever to walk down the strip, and there's nobody. I mean, there's a few of the you know hotels are open, but there's nobody walking in the streets. There's not you know activity. It was like it was really eerie. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Well, that's what we're hearing in certain parts of you know cities, like even South Florida seems to be you know that's part of the problem there. Is people just don't care, and they're just you know congregating and having fun, and if not even in public places, you know just you know, personal parties. Most people here have been really good about wearing masks, and, you know, keeping social distancing. I know the restaurants that we go to are extremely safe. Uh, we only go to the ones that we know are clean, and you know, and, and they're not busy. What I love about this is I always look at the uh, the chat afterward. I save it and look at it, and or Jack sends it to me, and it's really kind of cool because you can tell everybody in the audience is like shouting out to each other and. Uh, and networking with each other and, and and again thanks everyone for being on here as a participant and also just you know coming on to hear what you know everybody has to say but I think this is a big part of who we are as an association and the networking is so important so it's I just love seeing that and I do I mean I, I read it afterward um, but then I follow it during it as well so if you do have a question and you know that you can choose to either do it for a panelist and or everyone so if you're trying to shout out to a lot of different people make sure it says everyone not just panelists we'll see both um, but uh, I just want to start out with the introductions we've got you know um, Dave Woolley is the director of, of culinary for Buffalo Wild Wings you guys have known him for years from other places Red Robin for many years as well um, and very involved in our board. Uh, Desmond Fannin is a, a board member, has been for many years uh, with GCIA. He's a director of culinary training and support for Sodexo North America and has some interesting things that you'll learn from him today about what's happening in their uh, very uh, interesting world. And then uh, Chris Rowe is the vice president of operations for Fresh Concepts. And I think the the, the produce industry is certainly one that is very, very interesting, as we all know. And uh, Chris has got some great information to uh, bring to the table here today. And of course, you all know Jack Lee, the uh, haiku master at, at Data Central. So Jack's got some interesting slides for us as well that we'll, uh, we'll do. But why don't we start out with um, Dave, we kind of had you, you know, first on the docket. Let's, uh, and, and we'll get right into your background there. Um, but it, one thing, the question I had for Dave in the beginning was interesting. It's like, you know, I know sports plays such a major role, you know, in your an annual revenue. It's like, you know... Right. How do you replace? There's been no sports for months, and you had a great answer to that. So I'll just leave it at that and talk about what happened in March and April and where you are today. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, March March is a very huge month for a sports bar, especially Buffalo Wild Wings. March Madness didn't happen, right? So, you know, what what happens there is, uh, you know, we we did hurt for a little while, but you know, what we come to find out is, you know, wings are. They're comfort food, you know, uh, in one way or another. And uh, we, although we did struggle, uh, technologically speaking, because we had a flood of people come onto the internet for us to order food, and it was a good problem to have. And we had to, like, adjust our broad, uh, bandwidth and try to figure out how to, you know, accommodate all these new extra orders that we're going to do at curbside or pickup or delivery. And, um, but, you know, it turns out that no matter what people still wanted to eat wings. Um, and so that was, that was really great for us in a way, you know, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Uh, there was a lot of major decisions that happened in order for us to flip the switch on a lot of things, uh, really good decision-making. And I'd say also fast decision-making, which, uh, you know, for a big brand that has almost 1300 units, uh, it's, it, it, it was really astonishing to me to, to see us move really fast, uh, you know, out in the field and corporately uh, to do things, to make things work. Um, that's what it was all about. Like just make it, trying to make it work the best we could for our consumer, but also for, you know, uh, for our employees. Hey, I, I got to ask, have you seen any change in the spiciness level of wings that people are ordering during a pandemic? Are they like, 
I'm doing a family thing, so I'm going lowest common denominator, keep it mild, or is it like world's on fire anyways? I may as well go, <laughs> go with the spiciest one. Uh, that's a really great question that I wish I knew the answer to. Um, I don't know what if if anything changed in the in the world of sauces for us. Um, gosh, uh, I really wish I knew that. Uh, I, like we, I mean, we have a lot of core things that like stay the same, but yeah, there there may have been a switch, and I and I'm I'm just sorely uh, missed on that. Oh yeah, what what have you seen in menu mix that's moved around for you? Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, our our wings actually rose. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of ancillary items on our menu, you know, if you wanted this, if you wanted that. Uh, we actually came to the point where uh, we were going to limit the menu because we saw such a rise in chicken wings. Uh, but we ended up deciding not to do that uh, because uh, we actually thought that we'd be able to save a little bit of money, but we ended up doing the math and figuring out, you know, if we take these things away for a month and then we have to get them back on the menu when we open back up. Cause there were so many question marks like in April, especially like, well, what are we going to open back up? It's like three weeks from now, three months from now, three, you know, we didn't, we didn't know any of that kind of stuff. And, and we also didn't know how it was going to peak uh, with our uh, delivery or curbside or pickup or anything like that. So uh, we, we made a decision to stay with the entire menu. Um, Yes, uh, the wings were definitely at peak, uh, but we, we are still selling salads and wraps and burgers and things like that as well. But yeah, cool. wings dominated. How many restaurants are open now for dine-in around the country? Yeah, we're, we're at about 65% uh, right now uh, total, uh, which, is, which is pretty good for us. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy about that. Now there's been, especially recently, there's been a lot of fluctuation um, with that. Uh, but we're we're kind of stable at uh, about sixty five percent. And are some of the ones that aren't open because of state regulations and things? Or yeah. Are, okay. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing right there is that uh, negotiating different kinds of state regulations. I, I mean, I I have very little to do with that stuff and trying yeah. to even understand it. So I had to like pick a couple people's brains to even understand like, well, what in particular? And well, this state's doing this, and this state's doing that, and so. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely some issues with that. But uh, again, I'll go back to saying that I think that our, our curbside and pickup and delivery is, is pretty substantial. Um, yeah. uh, I am, I'm very, very excited about even one sport coming to fruition. Um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're a big proponent of like UFC fighting, right? So uh, we, had, uh, we had a pretty good weekend because of the, the fight that happened this weekend. So it's just kind of interesting how, how the sports are kind of really, uh, even subver subversively like making an impact to our business, whether they're picking it up or actually going into our restaurants and trying to dine. Have you seen any impact from the, the recent rise in cases? Has that touched business at all? Is that a question for me? Oh yes. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. For you. Yeah. Um, Repeat the question. Or yeah, sorry. Rephrase so the question. The, I'm trying to understand a little bit. The recent surge in COVID cases, have you yeah. seen that impact business at all or traffic? Um, no, honestly. Yeah. Um, not, not in the last, in the last two weeks, it's been kind of a little on the crazy side with, uh, with extra cases. And I would say that the last two weeks have been pretty good for us. Yeah. Um, but you're relying again, on again. I want to go back to the fact that I think that uh, chicken wings are every bit as uh, comfort food as just about anything else. That and you would relying consider. on takeout and, and curbside and all of that yes. and delivery. Yes, and that's probably why, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Desmond, why don't we jump in and, and ask you a little bit what's happening in your world? All right, uh, college, university. I mean, all of it. Corporate dining. I mean, you, you just you yeah. Know, well, the, the main thing, of course, uh, health care and seniors, you know, that that hasn't stopped. Um, seniors has modified a little bit uh, with the delivery methods. Um, but of course, universities, K-12 uh, completely stopped, um, except for K-12. We were doing the uh, we continue to do uh, the feeding for especially for those lower income uh, school districts. Um, 
And then uh, sports and leisure, we're turning a lot of the arenas into feeding um, uh, venues or, or whatever. We use the venue for feeding for the uh, health care uh, essential workers and things like that, since there's no real, you know, sporting events going on right now. Um, but then universities is that's one of those things that's kind of in the air right now um, because we're trying to figure out what everybody's going to do. It's, it's you know, every every university is different. Um, some of them may come back completely virtual for the whole semester. Some may be virtual for the first two or three months. So we have to kind of stay on our toes and adjust and have contingency plans ready to pull the pull the trigger with whichever direction the president of the college decides to go. And uh, corporate services them. is kind of the same way. It's, you know, you have those, uh, a lot of companies have furloughed a lot of people and a lot of people are still home with their kids and things like that. So population is down in the, uh, in the uh, accounts, but they want to come back, but they don't know exactly when they're coming back because everything is kind of hinging on schools as well too. So, um, you know, it's kind of all intertwined right now. It's a lot of nebulum going on right now. So, Why don't you talk a little bit about how, what, how do you plan for this when you don't know? Um, you know, universities are going to be open in a few weeks, or they may not be, or there may be people on campus or not on campus. Can you talk us through the whole planning process and your steps with that? Yeah, and I know uh, campus specifically, the segment specifically has, you know, more steps than I'm aware of, but I can talk to what I, what I actually know. Um, I know there are three different contingency plans, um, not just in campus, but in all the segments. There's, um, first of all, we've done comeback menus for all of the segments. So we're looking at items, working with supply, looking at items uh, that we can menu that are readily available, uh, things that we know that we can procure. Um, so that they can actually run a menu. And then we're also looking at contingency plans. Okay, uh, you know, we have a complete virtual model for uh, schools, universities, um, where everything is, is online order and we have an app that we've been using for a while and that continues to get a lot of use. Um, so they can do online ordering, we can do delivery, curbside pickup, all that, all that type of contactless uh, dining. And then you have like the middle of the road where um, the cafe is open, but it's only uh, grab and go prepackaged type items, even um, uh, hot entrees that can be rethermed, cook them in house, chill them properly, package them, and um, they can be reheated in dorm rooms or wherever. Um, and some, and, and a lot of that will be self-serve. Uh, they can pay online or as a cashless station where they can pay. Um, and then you have the possibility of everybody coming back. So you have to be ready for that too. So we have to make sure that the uh, spacing in the dining room is adequate. The, uh, the flow of the, of the servery is, counter is uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever way it works for the design in the, in the cafe and uh, make sure we have proper signage and things like that. So um, a lot of balls in the air. You just got to figure out which one to grab at, at which point. And like I said, each location could be completely different. So there could be a district manager that has, I don't know, 10 accounts and, you know, like a quarter of them are on this uh, platform and then the other ones are on that one. So, yeah. I mean, we're in late, too, we're late can... July, right? I mean, we're not that far from what would be the start of the school year. Right. Yeah. Have most colleges declared what they're going to do yet, or is that really still up in the air? Still waiting on some. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it's almost like it's just like everything you do. You wish everybody would answer you at the same time. Yeah. You know, and, and you can plan. Um, but yeah, some of it is still kind of in the air, and I think we've uh, internally kind of kind of drew sand, drew line in the sand. It's like, okay, we need to know about this date so we can staff and things like that. Um, but I don't want to speak about it too much because I'm not sure exactly where we're doing it, but I'm sure a lot of that is going on as well. So, um, Kevin, so I think you were asking about staffing. Um, we've had a lot of uh, furloughs, of course, 
with hourly staff. Um, but we've also had a lot of people that didn't, that decided they weren't coming back um, after the whole unemployment uh, stretch. Um, so what we've been doing is moving around as many accounts, uh, moving around as many employees from segment to segment as uh, as we can. So um, even yesterday or day before on Monday, we had an email go out from the CEO of North America saying that, you know, we there are some healthcare accounts where um, I don't know if people were exhausted and just kind of, you know, left, but they've been working very hard for since March. Uh, February, March, and a lot of them is just, you know, tired, can't do it anymore. So they're having to backfill those positions, which you kind of expected in K-12 and universities, but you never expected to have to backfill in uh, healthcare. So just trying to move people around, especially managers as well. So it's kind of tough. Yeah. This is a, sort of a dumb question, but if you're a, if you're a student and you're at a school that's going virtual, are you more than likely going back home to live with parents and just not even being in that city or are you sort of staying in student housing and just being locked up for the year? That's a good question because again, every university is different. Some of them may want them to stay there so that, you know, especially since they've already paid for housing Yeah. and you kind of look at um, ways to do, you know, deliveries, whether it's robots or they come down and get it or, um, but then there are some that are just, you know, sending them home. Good. So, so you're still feeding those kids if they're in housing just be a delivery or something instead then. right okay right yeah. or it may be a, a cafe that's partially open yeah um, and desmond there's uh there's off-campus housing too that people already paid for the year right and so they still have so they buy packages too from you right so you have to right. accommodate them as well right and that's a little further than a robot can travel. So there, there are vans <laughs> and trucks and things like that. And it's a lot of coordination. You know, you, you may have to have specific times where deliveries are made and you have to place orders by a certain time. And there's, there's one round of delivery every, I don't know, every few hours or something like that. So uh, a lot of coordination. But we got to be ready because our, our clients expect us to figure it out. Wow. Yeah, it's complicated. Hey, why don't you also talk about, you had that six foot kitchen you talked about, which to me is really, I think, uh, quite amazing and a very interesting thing for, you know, for you guys to implement. Yeah, so six foot kitchen in a nutshell, I try to be very quick with this because it take forever to explain. Um, but it's, um, it's a way for the, the unit managers and the unit employees to be able to keep uh, not only the customers safe and the food safe, but to keep themselves safe in the back of the house as well. So we uh, targeted three, uh, six different pillars. It's uh, personal hygiene, PPE, uh, clean and contact surfaces, um, food production, uh, food storage, and accepting deliveries. So we took them through every aspect of their daily uh, routine to show them how they can do this. Um, in a, a COVID in a, in a COVID environment. So um, even down to the deliveries, I know a lot of the vendors have their own practices that they have to adhere to, but um, we just have to remind them everything stops with us before it gets, you know, when it comes to that back door, we are responsible to make sure that food is safe and to make sure that, you know, we are all safe. And that includes, you know, taking the temperature of the delivery person if that's required. Um, having a designated spot for invoices to be signed con uh, contactlessly. That's the word it is now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, you got to think of all of those things. And it, and it helps them because it's, they already have the stress of dealing with the pandemic themselves. They may have family members that are dealing with it, but then they have to come out and work. And, you know, there are normal pressures of being in the kitchen as it is. And having to do that while you have to watch every single step, we try to take a lot of that thinking out of the picture for them, kind of give them what to do. So that that's been that's been pretty helpful. It was it actually got a mention in the New York Times, I think, last week, I believe. Um, so yeah, we're pretty pretty proud of that. It's awesome. That's cool, Chris. You want to you know jump in here and let's talk about produce because. 
Um, you're living in the perfect world, right? Perishable items in a place where you don't know what you're going to sell tomorrow. Sounds kind of easy. Yeah, Curtis has been a lot of fun. <laughs> it's kept us busy. Uh, yeah, I'm a little biased, but I think produce could be the hardest segment uh, considering the shelf life is so low. Uh, a lot of products out there can last for months, perhaps even a year or longer with produce. Even your best commodities outside of potatoes, you know, would last 14 days. And that's including uh, the time to get it, you know, from Salinas or from the growing region to the distributor and then to your back door. So really you're talking more like six, seven, eight days, even on the longest products. So it has created some challenges. Uh, Fresh Concepts has a unique view. We work with about 250 brands uh, from fast casual to fine dining. Uh, we work with casinos, we work with GPO groups, pretty wide range. So, you know, we're running analytics every week on kind of who's doing well, who's doing what. Um, it's interesting to see, you know, there's a lot of brands, pizza brands, uh, you know, they've mentioned it, the, the wing brands, a lot of, a lot of these brands are doing really well, specifically those who are positioned into catering or to go or take out before our numbers are showing that we're seeing a lot of those brands are at 80%, a couple are actually over hundred percent. So we have a couple of brands that are doing more today than they were doing last year, same month, which is pretty incredible. Uh, overall, that's not the case. We, uh, we saw an 85% drop the last two weeks of March. Uh, we only represent food service. So as you can imagine, it's pretty brutal (laughs) the last couple of weeks. April was down about 65%. Uh, Now we've kind of crept our way back to close to 50% recovered. Uh, But because we have that wide range of of, uh, clientele, it gives us a pretty nice view into how the food service industry is is doing overall. Because we have different segments in each area. Uh, What I think that is important to understand in produce is that uh, the buying power and the ripple effect in supply chain is really important. Uh, with such low shelf life, these distributors have to bring trucks into the facility two, three, four times a week. And when you shut down 85% of the, the country in food service, you know, there's a lot of products on the trucks those first, uh, that first week in March. Uh, and it lost a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars across the country per distributor, some more. And then, uh, so that was the original issue. But now, uh, Jack mentioned it, states are opening, closing, this constant um, volatility in, in what restaurants are opening, how they're opening, the type of menus they're opening, whether it's limited, whether it's a full menu. So we're, we're honestly just trying to keep up with all the clients that we have and what, you know, what they're doing, how they're, how they're changing their model and trying to make sure that product that they need for their menu is on the truck at the distributor's facility, you know, on time. Uh, and that's, that's been a, a real challenge. Yeah, Chris, so one of the things we've seen in our, in our research is it's the uncertainty for the operator that's, causing them to shift away or they've shifted a little bit away from fresh produce because of the shelf life thing, or they used to get multiple deliveries a week. Now they get just one delivery a week or one delivery every two weeks. So they've gone to other formats, but as the forecasting becomes clearer, and I think it has probably become a little clearer now than it was say one or two months ago. I assume that fresh produce has made a bit of a comeback. Have you sort of seen that in, in, in your volume? We have, yeah, it's a mixed bag. Depends on which client and, and market basket you're referring to. Overall, absolutely. Uh, fresh produce is back about 45% or more, close to half to where we were in January and February. Let's also be mindful that January and February was a tremendous two months for the industry uh, overall. You know, it was great numbers year over year in terms of growth for food service. And uh, so it's, it's probably recovered more naturally than we than we're given it credit for. Um, with that said, it, it, it still has uh, a lot of long ways to go, obviously. And um, we are seeing some limited menus. We're seeing distributors are doing a great job bringing as much product as they can. But you made a good point. So we don't do well. The British distributors, the growers, uh, we can't do well unless the restaurants are doing well. So we have to do everything we can to support the restaurants. If they need products, we need to find a way to get it. We need to find a way to work on substitutes, find a way to work on different pack sizes, different products, get something to serve, right? Because that is no good. And so that's really the message that we have. And I think most of the produce distributors and growers have is let's support the restaurants as much as we can um, because we need, to, we need to get them back, back up and running. How does the produce supply chain look? So if, if uh, industry is back up and running almost full speed, is there enough product in the pipe to, to keep, us, keep up with the demand? Yeah, so there's been some, obviously some changes. Uh, products have been rerouted to retail. Uh, retail only has so much square footage available, as you know. 
they can only sell so much on their own. So there's still quite a bit of product available. Growers want the food service demand back. Yeah. You know, distributors want that food service demand back. A lot of British distributors, especially the specialty distributors across the country, we work with close to 140. And they're all a little different, obviously, in what they specialize in. But most rely on food service by a large percentage. Retail is usually a small percentage of their business. And so they really need that back uh, for efficiencies in buying, for efficiencies in, in maximizing those trucks going from California out to their facilities. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to support that. We're trying to get as much efficiencies as we can. What you're seeing, though, Jack, is people are being very creative. And I think custom distribution is becoming very important in industry. I think uh, even three years ago, the idea of a broadliner and a British distributor working together, it was happening in small capacities, but those conversations now are happening at a much faster rate. You know, how do you consolidate SKUs? How do you, how do you take what British distributors do very well? How do you take what broadline distributors do very well? And how do you pair those things up and work with companies that can uh, you know, bring you the best value and maximize drop sizes in an uncertain market, maximize efficiencies in your cost, and that's good for everybody. Hey, on that front too, Chris, talk a little bit about, you know, from, you know, and I know that plants, depending on what the crop is, will vary, but from seed to harvesting, you know, and so planning for your farmers is really difficult because, you know, what is business going to be like in September or November or even January? So, but talk a little bit about what the time frame is like from seed to harvest in most crops. Sure. Yeah, and that answers uh, I, one of Jack's parts, too, is about kind of how that demand and supply is changing. Uh, most crops, like spring mix, can be 45 days. It, weather does uh, change the, the length and life cycle of that product. Spring mix can be 45 days. Romaine could be 90, could be 70 if it's, you know, 90 degrees in Salinas. But most crops, on average, will be in the ground 65, 70 days. as a good rule of thumb. Uh, so, yeah, when this hit in March those plants are in the ground. So they can't change their plantings for, you know, two months essentially, or even longer. Uh, so I think growers, from what we understand, have limited some planting. Uh, can't speak for all of them, obviously, but some have limited some planting in anticipation of lower demand in food service, knowing that retail can't take all that demand and shift it. Not to the point where we feel it'll create any issues in supply or any shortages or anything, but I think they're gonna do their part uh, financially and try to reduce supply to, to the need of demand, right? And we are seeing that um, we're hitting that point now in July where those new plantings are going to start being harvested, right? Uh, in fact, we've already been seeing that the last few weeks. Uh, but food service demand is still down pretty significantly. And so we haven't, we haven't had a huge influx of food service demand to really figure out and calculate what that looks like in terms of reduced plantings. Uh, I'd say that we should be aware that it happened, but I don't, I don't think that any produce distributor or grower or shipper uh, will not have products available you know, should this nozzle be turned on and food service comes back 80% or so. Interesting. Jack, I know you had some slides you wanted to share as well. Is this a good time? to uh, do? Yeah, ha happy to. And uh, before I get into that, I actually just wanted to get everyone's take on something. So we're almost at the end of July. Uh, so in nine days, the additional $600 a week from the federal government is scheduled to run out. And, and that was a thing, right? You know, you wanted to bring workers back from furlough and some said, actually, I sort of like this more. Uh, so let's not do that. Are we anticipating any sort of a change in the labor market for restaurants and whatnot, you know, come August 1st, all of a sudden, is there going to be a mad rush to try to come back to work or what's going to happen in a week and a half? I mean, Dave, that might be more, most directly for you, but I think everyone can, can chime in on this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that for sure. Um, what I, what I do know is um, we, we took the time to, to kind of reorganize how we were going to think about, we were already thinking about it anyway before COVID, but we took the time to reorganize how we were going to do our service model in the front of the house. And so those, we, sure, we had some, uh, some furloughed employees. Um, and, and if we were going to change this, then that means we sometimes uh, in some cases would actually change the employee out too. Um, uh, so to that point, you know, what's going to happen now with, with that money running out, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I don't think that, I think that in one case that it's, it's a slow rollout for us to open up uh, and that allows us to be 
more flexible and uh, time to figure out things. Um, but overall, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't know personally what that means. Well, on, on our end, there was a lot of concern, um, a lot of conversation around a lot of the frontline employees making more in some yeah. cases than than they were when they were actually working. Um, but actually, I was having a conversation with, with Kevin, and it, it dawned on me through, through the conversation that with that money running out, maybe we will get them back, uh, the ones that we thought that wouldn't return. So um, still don't know until it happens, but, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, get these people employed again. Yeah. Cause I don't think we've seen any definitive sign that that's going to be extended beyond July yet. Right. It's just sort of hanging out there and we're like nine days away from right. potentially a pretty significant event. Uh, okay. Well, I'd love to share just a couple of slides out and I'm going to start with a couple that you may have seen before, but I think they are, they do offer, some important context and then some new things as well. So, um, you know, in this, in this time that we're in right now where we're working with more limited menus, uh, we said this before, consumers are broadly okay with this. If you gotta do a smaller menu, it's fine. I do think it's better if you can do the full menu. People, consumers definitely appreciate that, but they at least understand if you're rolling out with a smaller menu. The question is how long can you do this for before the consumer says, yeah, I sort of want to see like all that stuff I really loved before return. It does seem like every week you're hearing of more places trimming stuff off the menu, not just um, for this like immediate comeback from the pandemic thing, but maybe even making some permanent deletions as well. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But I really wanted to harp on one point, which has been said before, but I think it's so important because we're starting to hear um, just some things in the markets where some brands are saying, you know what, I, we're not in a place to focus on innovation, um, in, you know, in the immediate future. And we really, I just really wanted to identify again, like that is, that may not be the best strategy, that if we lose sight of innovation, we often uh, lose sight of what actually brings people out of their home and into places like restaurants in the first place. Um, the chart here, which we've shown a couple times in the past is, the percentage of all new items, new menu releases, LTOs, uh, new permanent items, uh, all new menu launches that are combo and value meals. Historically, it's like maybe 9 or 10%, depending on the year. In 2009, coming out of the economic crisis, coming out of the recession, in one month, that number hit 37%, where basically all these chains said, you know what, we're not going to do innovation, we're just going to do like value promos and like special prices and, you know, two for 20 and dollar menu types of things. They won't be new items. They won't be new dishes or anything. We're just going to reprice some things. And that's going to be our strategy to get people back in through the door. And that could work on a very short-term basis as a stimulant. But if discounting becomes your long-term strategy and you're not putting out new food products, eh, that becomes sort of damaging to the brand pretty quickly. And you can sort of see this, right? So this is um, the percentage of all new menu items over the past decade or so, actually like the last 15 years, that fall into each one of these different menu categories, um, all the items that have been launched by chains, right? This is sort of that historic number. So desserts are like 11.5% of all new chain. Menu introductions, sandwiches are about 10.5%. Here's what it looked like in 2009, coming out of the financial crisis. And you can see we had some categories that got sort of more attention, relatively speaking. And they're all sort of like entree categories, right? Sandwiches and combo meals that we talked about, you know, kids' entrees. And then you have these categories that got less attention than they had historically, which tend to be the categories where you can actually increase check average. Someone goes into a restaurant or buys from a restaurant, they're almost certainly going to get an entree. There's no guarantee they're going to order a beverage or a dessert or a side or an appetizer. So why wouldn't we be focusing our innovation efforts on some of these categories instead, right? That's what's going to build check average. That's what's going to keep the thing interesting. Instead, we sort of just like forgot about those in 2009. We said, let's focus on the core instead on entrees and price promos. We basically removed the consumer's in incentive or motivation to add to their check. And that's something we want to make sure that we avoid this time around. So what we found is that innovation coming out of this pandemic, or even during in the midst of the pandemic, we should at least have things in our pipeline it's going to be even more important, right? So here's a look at of consumers that say they they were interested in these types of trends coming into coronavirus. 
This is the percentage that say they will continue to be interested in them coming out of coronavirus. It's not like the trends just sort of stop dead in their tracks, right? These are like big numbers, like 80s, almost 90%. Some of these are trends that will probably be even further accelerated by COVID and will find entirely new audiences on top of that too. So we have to stay on top of things. And, you know, the clearest sign to us, whether we're in a, we're in a COVID world or not, when we're asked, will trends continue to move? Will food and flavor trends continue to pick up steam coming out of the pandemic? It's really simply answered by this, right? So this is a look at every food flavor ingredient, you know, something on the menu, yeah, you name it, health, you know, healthy term, um, what have you, and how much it has, uh, they've increased or decreased in menu prominence over the last four years. So things that have like shrunk more than 10% on menus, you'd say are declining. Then you have the things that are not moving that much up or down, those are flat. Then you have some things that are moving, maybe they've grown 10, 20, 30, 40%. Those are trending upwards. Then you have the super growth stuff that's grown 50% or more on menus in the last four years. And the key to look at is, well, what percentage of all foods, flavors, and ingredients fall into each one of these four categories? About 18% of things, you know, foods, flavors, and ingredients are declining. About half are flat. About a quarter are trending upwards. And about 7% are in that super growth stage. So super growth means the thing is growing like wildfire. Maybe it's big, maybe it's small, but based on where it was, it has rocketed forward. Um, it's a super trend, so to speak. And you do the math, there's over, over 5,000 different foods, flavors, ingredients on US menus, right? From the really esoteric stuff to the super ubiquitous stuff, 7% of them are in super growth. That means you have over 300 super trends to choose from. You could do a daily, once a day trend calendar and virtually fill it with just a different super trend every single day of the year. That says a lot, right? You think about what life was like back in like the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. Someone could ask you, hey, what's the big food trend of the year? And maybe there was actually like an answer. Like in the 90s, it's like, oh yeah, Chipotle, that's our poster child for flavored trends. And then the early 2000s, it was Sriracha, you know? If someone asks you or us that question now, there actually is no definitive answer. The answer is there's actually lots of trends. We have super trend fragmentation these days, right? I liken it to television, right? So I grew up in many, maybe some of you did too, um, in a time when you had like, you know, maybe like a, just a handful of TV stations on TV. You might even have one of those TVs that had like that weird rotary dial you use to like pick which channel you're going to watch. Because you had like a max of like 12 choices or 13, depending on. The dial. Now YouTube alone has tens of millions of channels, not, not tens of millions of videos, tens of millions of different channels to watch. The same thing has happened with food trends. We went from having one or two big super trends in a year to having dozens, if not hundreds of smaller micro trends that are all rocketing forward. The mere fact that we have so many different trends with so much diversity to choose from is the clearest indicator that they will not stop because there's so many things that are simultaneously pushing forward. And here's the thing, right? So I think many of you might know the work that Data Central does around this thing called the menu adoption cycle. I think we're looking at different types of pasta noodles over here and how you have some things in a really early inception stage. Then you have the really ubiquitous stuff on the other end of the spectrum. It's sort of like the life cycle of a trend. So if you're talking about pasta noodles, it would look something like this. Well, we did a thing where we took, um, uh, consumers and we looked at basically all the different types of foods you could eat and we asked them for all these different types of things whether it's a food or a flavor or something is this something that you would prefer to you know have or make at home or would you rather get it from a restaurant or someplace away from home right so like peanut butter and jelly sandwich is like super super at home and then you know some other things are really really away from home preference and we said, let's sort of um, compute averages for that. Do you want it from home or away from home? And let's do it by the stage of the menu adoption cycle. And it sort of looks like this, that the earlier the stage you're in, the more people, the more consumers say, you know what, this is something I really want to get away from home versus at home. By the time you get in ubiquity, that late stage, like you know, all the common stuff, like you know, spaghetti, for instance, People are like, yeah, I'm pretty much just as happy getting that from my house as I am from a restaurant. But when you go earlier stage, people are like, yeah, I'm really thinking like restaurant is the way to go for that. 
if we slow down with innovation and bring new things to the menu, like earlier stage stuff, which is what restaurants are really, really good at, we are basically removing one of the primary motivations consumers have to go to a restaurant or get something from a restaurant in the first place. We're only going to reinforce their, hey, you know, I may as well just get something from home because there's not so much new stuff to try out there anyways. So uh, I think, you know, most chains that we've talked to have said, yes, we want, we're pushing forward with innovation and maybe we're re reconfiguring it some way versus another, you know, maybe we're rethinking what, what seasonality actually means given that the calendar has shifted so much. A couple of others have said, yeah, you know, innovation is not as much of a priority for us right now. We're going to pump the brakes on that a little bit. I would really caution against um, that second viewpoint that it would be okay to just sort of pump the brakes on innovation and focus on value pricing and discounts instead. I think it's sort of damaging to a brand, certainly in the long run. You know, people no longer will know why they're coming to you um, if you do that, if it's not about the food. But also, you'd be removing one of the things that people are looking to restaurants for. They want new stuff. They can get the common stuff at home already. Um, so just a, as a piece of advice, I would say let's try to avoid doing that. So um, that's, that's my spiel. And actually, I would just use that as a segue. Um, you know, Chris, Dave, Desmond, if, if you have you know, similar thoughts or if there are things that you just think are barriers to, to doing innovation these days that we should be aware of as well. I can uh, talk to that a little bit. Um, yeah, th throughout the whole COVID process, uh, we we said to ourselves that we weren't going to stop um, well, innovating and not going to stop thinking about what could be in the future. Um, you know, some of it was unknown. Like, well, we don't know if we're going to you know be back full in three months, like I said earlier, or three years. We you know, regardless of that, we still got to keep moving forward. So. Uh, we, we made that decision consciously uh, to do it. Now, we also had things in the hopper already, too, yeah. you know, prior to happening. So, you know, we, 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 we did make a decision uh, to keep going forward with some of those items. In fact, it was going back and forth. Should we put the brakes on? Should we not put the brakes on? How are we going to do this? Um, and ultimately uh, came down to having some sort of compromise basically to put the brakes on some of it but not on all of it um, and that's kind of how we rolled it out uh, we haven't rolled it out yet but uh, it's actually going to happen pretty soon here uh, uh, and also we have some testing that's coming up here and in order to get to that testing we had work to do prior to that right so um, we're testing some new items uh, we're pretty excited about it and uh, the other thing that's really interesting, too, is that we had a full menu launch, a brand new menu launch uh, that happened in February that uh, at the end of February that we didn't really get any credit for. We didn't yeah. we didn't really promote it that much. Uh, we had we uh, we drew up commercials. We drew up um, uh, social media, uh, you know, presence. Uh, we do. We did all these things that we never actually like fully launched a, a campaign for it, um, and so we have this opportunity to kind of do that again. But it was all stuff that we were doing on an innovative platform, if you will. Um, are you relaunching those items? Or are they on the menu already right now? Yeah, they're already on the menu, but we're gonna re-promote them. We never promoted them, I guess, yeah. is what I'm really saying. So, um, but yeah, you can't. We, we need to think out in advance anyway. So, you know, our philosophy is trying to think out a year, uh, maybe even further out in advance. So we're thinking about stuff all the time, talking about it internally, uh, playing, playing with food, you know, uh, doing the things that we have to do uh, in order to innovate. Hey, Dave, you also mentioned something, too, about you've got new menu items planned for the end of the summer. And how do you do testing, right? How do you bring people together? You, you know, you said like a hundred people in a room is going to be difficult to do to you virtual testing. How do you do this? What do you do? Yeah. Um, well, we're going to do kind of a classic CLT test. So uh, that's, I, I, I kind of was shocked to know that we were going to be able to get people in a room pretty easily. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I actually went and visited the, the, one of the facilities this morning and they have it spaced out very, very nicely in there. And, and I, and I, 
I was kind of like, okay, this, this is still doable. And I know that there are other brands that are doing these kinds of tests as well. So, uh, and not just within our circle, but you know, other brands that are out there. Um, Atlanta's a pretty big hotspot for brands. So, uh, but yeah, I was like, oh, okay. That, uh, that was a little bit of a head scratcher. I, I didn't think that people were, were ready for something like that, but they were. Yeah, it's so important. Desmond, I actually had a question for you. The, you know, your CNU audience, college kids are among the most forward progressive eaters that you'll find. And uh, especially when it comes to health trends, uh, foods from around the world and, and whatnot. And it seems like one of the big trends that will emerge out of COVID that's you know, stronger than even before is the demand for immunity uh, coming from our food, like immune, boost, immune boosting properties. Are you right. talking about that in any of your offerings, specifically for CNU or, or otherwise? Um, there had there had already been a little bit of discussion around that, as, as you know, especially with plant based and kind of kind of roll into that. Um, but I'm sure it's going to increase, you know, once once everybody gets back, because staying safe is going to be on everybody's mind, and that includes the food that you eat. Um, and I know uh, to kind of go back to the innovation piece, we closed our innovation center uh, for a while, but now it's starting to open back up. So now starting to think about what the new normal or the, or the next normal is going to look like as far as food. And um, so that's, that's top of mind as we start back innovating. Um, Cause like I said before, the main thing right now was getting everybody on a, on a menu that would, that they could afford to, yeah. you know, create i mean to, to execute but now going forward we, we need to start back we're starting back innovating so that's on the list that's good to hear hey chris i've got a question for you we had talked a little bit about <clears throat> um there's some um, some and we have a webinar we're doing tomorrow with pma and so we're deep into produce <laughs> conversations this week but there's a lot of angst about you know the uh, inconsistency uh, maybe more so now because of what's happening with supply, you know, and and uh, and demand. But um, you mentioned something about the even like regionally when you're working with the big companies who have distribution in parts like the southeast versus the west are using you know products from different countries even or different sources. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because that to me was kind of fascinating uh, to understand you're working with the same corporation. Uh, and ordering the same product, but they're not the same product. Yeah, so you're referring to specifications, cut sizes. Yeah. Um, In origin. Yeah, so, origin, right. Yeah. yeah, so you have a lot of big processors uh, around the country that will source lettuce from the East Coast, uh, source broccoli from Mexico versus Salinas or Yuma, depending on the time of the, time of the year. And, you know, they're going to do that for a couple of reasons. One is freight considerations. Uh, the other is it's a lot cheaper to grow product in Mexico versus California. Uh, and so you will see some inconsistency. If you were to measure and look at lettuce out of Salinas versus lettuce out of East Coast, typically your lettuce out of Florida, for example, has darker green leaves, um, not, not as big of hearts on the remain. So your chopped remains going to get less yield unless you like that dark green uh, leaf, which most restaurants don't want to include that. Um, so most of it's just regional sourcing. And so when you get a processor that has facilities in Florida or Chicago or Ohio, California, um, some will, and they all do a great job. They source whatever they have available to get you the same pack size, same cut, same product, but you will see some inconsistencies, even berries. There's a berry season in Florida. When you order strawberries out of Florida for about four, four months, they're going to see berries from Florida, right? Versus there's times of the year we're going to get uh, berries from California or Mexico. And that's all based on where things are being grown and availability. And that's really the beauty in produce is it changes consistently. Um, you know, it keeps us busy and, uh, and figuring out where to source products from. So it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an ever moving target because uh, when conditions are great, you don't hear much. When conditions are poor, you have a 14 day shelf life on the best products. You can imagine it takes a few days off that shelf life. And now you may only have two, three days in your kitchen with it. And that's if you store it properly. Right. One of the first things that's difficult now with the with the labor we talked about is proper storage and handling, proper shelf life, proper technique there. You gotta focus your time and attention on the biggest hierarchy of issues, and typically shelf life and storage is not that, right? Um, so that's one thing we're focusing on, just to kind of segue into Jack's question too, is in terms of innovation, we visited uh, over twenty five hundred restaurants last year. We're not doing that now. 
we can't get into coolers, we can't see products, we can't see our distributors, you know, we can't see our growers. Uh, so instead, now we're doing virtual meetings. You now we're offering virtual meetings with all the restaurants we, we work with to give them training, to try to give them the best shelf life possible. If you're getting one, two deliveries, these issues just get compounded. And it's not the restaurant's fault, it's not the distributor's fault, not the grower's fault. Uh, with that said, you've got product now in your coolers that might be two or three days older because you're not getting deliveries three, four days a week. These issues get bigger and bigger and your food cost percentages go up. And, and, and it has nothing to do with how you're ordering, it's just the fact that you're not storing it properly or the rotation is just not able to be as efficient, unfortunately. Yeah, Dave, I have one other thing that, you know, we talked about yesterday, I thought was quite interesting that um, you talked about some of the other brands that you have, you know, within, within your portfolio. And uh, in particular, you talked about Sonic and Jimmy John's. Can you bring that up again about the difference of what happened, you know, when this thing took place and what with those two yeah. companies? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, with, uh, with a company like Sonic specifically, um, I, I think the term we used internally was like, they're, they're almost like COVID proof because, you know, they have, they have, if you want, you have contactless, uh, uh way to, to get food from them. You know, you're pulling up to a drive through where you get to park and someone brings something to you. You don't have to do anything. You can pay everything off your app. Um, they actually, their March and April were, was better than their last year, March and April. Um, and, you know, if you look at it, like, you know, as a company, it, 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 it makes our entire company, you know, elevate too. So, um, which I think everybody appreciated. Uh, and then a company like Jimmy John's, on the other hand, you know, they have a lot of restaurants and you don't think about it. Like, you think delivery is going to be like a perfect thing for, uh, you know, for this time. And it, it, it just wasn't because delivery wasn't their hang up. Their hang up was that they had units that were in college campuses or that were, um, you know, uh, part of uh, an entertainment center or an entertainment area um, or business centers, uh, a lot of business centers, in fact. And so there was a lot of restaurants that were closed down just because of that, that there was no way that they were going to open back up. In fact, some of them are still not. But, you know, I don't know how many restaurants they're back up to, but I, I know that they're, they're back up and running, so to speak. But it's just, it's just kind of interesting where you think about, well, they are delivery, and we are in a delivery world for like three months, and they weren't, you know, as, as good as Sonic. Uh, I also like to tap, uh, tap back into the innovation question again. Um, and I, I'm sure some of us have done some, um, some virtual innovation sessions by now, uh, which is, is kind of interesting. And, and uh, you know, it, I think that that's maybe a way that's going to happen uh, more frequently as time goes on here and probably for a longer period of time. I mean, we're not even letting vendors into our corporate building right now. So um, how are we going to interact with a vendor? Uh, well, we would do it. We could do it virtually. Um, we did something fairly recently where we had uh, uh, we had a, a, an umami workshop actually uh, that we did with uh, with somebody who we're familiar with here with Robert Danhai uh, and you know he was it, it was great because it wasn't like we were tasting big things of food where um, we had to do a lot of cooking and and stuff like that it was more uh, very very small things that were uh, could be held somewhat ambient. Uh, so that we could go and taste those items. And so I think that that's, that's an interesting point of view, uh, thinking about how you can do, um, how you could do virtual tastings uh, and virtual innovation. Uh, I think that there's more to that. I think that, that we, there's just really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that. I think that there's a lot to be said for how that, that part of innovation can change here, especially in the next six months to a year. Um, because we don't know really what's going to happen. Uh, why not open yourself up to trying new things in a different way? Great. Uh, Kevin, I think we've hit the top of the hour. Just to yeah. time check. Yeah. Anybody have any closing thoughts? And then I'll say our thanks. But um... I had a closing just general question for, for people. Uh, I feel like, you know, when we're all working in an office, uh, you generally don't try to make appointments, you know, outside the hours of, let's say, nine to five with someone that's not in your company or maybe even people in your company. 
now that we're working from home, have the rules of when you can communicate with someone changed? Can I send you a meeting invite for like 6 p.m. now? And I didn't used to be able to do that. Like, has that dynamic changed? I feel like it has, but I don't know what the new rules are yet. I've, I've seen it um, kind of stay the same, but I've, I've just seen an uptick in the amount of, of requests. I mean, yeah. people still kind of, uh, you know, they, they respect your calendar. They respect the, you know, the, the grayed out spaces that you have on the bookends. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely an uptick in people wanting to get more of your time virtually. All right, so it sounds like we're not going to be doing the 9 p.m. conference calls anytime soon still. Chris that's still, that's still a no-no. Chime in on every, go ahead. I was just going to mention that, uh, you know, we internally, there's no commute, so we're taking advantage of those extra hours. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the other thing, too, is Chris and I had a conversation on Sunday afternoon. So um, my world has always been running events and doing things all over the country in different time zones. There really isn't a, a nine to five here when we're doing events on the West Coast. We work until eight or nine anyway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and, and you, Chris, I'm sure you're in California. You're probably up early, early every morning, kind of like the farmers right on the phone because you've got to answer the people on the East Coast when they're up. Yeah. Just so. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks to all of our sponsors and members who are on with us today. And uh, thanks again to all of you guys. You know, Jack, as always, thanks for being with us. You know, Chris, Desmond, Dave, really appreciate the information today. I thought it was great. We'll have this video put together and we'll put it up on Friday. Typically, we have it up on Friday. Uh, the other six webinars are all up there and we will do this again in two weeks. So see you, uh, you know, a week from next Wednesday. Bye, thanks, everybody. Everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you.